Good. So let's go through today. And so today we talk about all the bones of the, of the arms first, and then the legs afterwards. So I got these articulated skeletons. That's what we use for the test. I'll bring the pelvises on Wednesday. She, the prep was a little off today, so I don't have those. But I'll bring those on Wednesday, so we'll review with that. We'll be fine. So when I go to the upper extremities, and you should have one of those on your desks. We got a few bones here. Also, we have skeletons. Make sure you make use of the three skeletons we have during the lap portion, because that is very helpful. So when it's articulated, what we're looking at is right here, the upper extremity. So we start with the shoulder blade. <clears throat> and the shoulder blade is in the back. You can actually feel it right here in the back of yourself, too. It's that bone that's pretty skinny and is really weird looking. And it's sort of the connection from the rib cage, they have a lot of muscles that can attach there, to then the arm and the upper extremities. So the shoulder blade is, a, is going to be attached to the rib cage, and then the arms hangs off of the shoulder blade and is attached to the shoulder blade. So it's kind of funny. It's almost like we have two joints here. We have to move the arm, and then at about here, we end up moving the shoulder blade as well. So the shoulder blade goes this way. On this, it doesn't. It's just glued onto it. But in real life, it's like two joints, one here and then one here. I know, interesting stuff. So let's look at the scapula. Let's see what I got here. Here we go. So there's the shoulder blade from the back. Here it sits in the rib cage. You can see that. When we look at the terms that we want to look, that we want to learn from the scapula, we have. Oh look, that's not on here. Let me see what it's at. I'm actually not going to worry about the body of the scapula, so just scratch that out. All right, now what I'm going to start with is the borders of the scapula. So you think, look, look at that in the back, it's like a, a triangle shape, like that. And so we got a few borders, we got a border here, we got a border here, and we actually also got a border on top. We don't really worry about the top one in our descriptions, but we worry about the border on the outside, right in here, and what's here? The armpit, our axilla. Right, so that border is right where the axilla is. So we call that border the lateral border or also the axillary border. And on the other side, we're going to go here. You can see that. We're going to go towards the spine. So we call that the medial border or also the vertebral border. Vertebral. Something like that. Vertebra. And then we have, at the bottom, we got a fairly steep angle, and it's at the bottom, so we call that the inferior angle. Nice. We can handle that. Oh, look, I have superior border on, the sh on there as well. Let me see if I... Yeah, see, superior border here. The top portion here, this portion here. That's the superior border. I think that one will be called out for the test, because it's a little bit... Weirder. But back to this picture. So that was the inferior angle. That's the lateral border, medial border. And now we have some. Uh, we have some interesting thing here. This here is a ridge. When you feel that ridge, you know you are in the back side of the scapula. You're looking from the back. And that ridge is known as the spine of the scapula. Yes? Is that the back? That's the back, yes. You see a posterior aspect? That will indicate it's from the back, the view. They can say posterior view too. So the spine of the scapula is that ridge. You can feel that right here when you touch yourself in the back. And you follow that ridge to the outside, and then that here is the tip of the shoulder blade, or the tip of the shoulder, actually. Right here, that's called the acromion. The tip of the shoulder is known as the acromion.
Yeah, some of these terms that are do double there. Do you see that? Median lateral border. I'm not so sure what I did there. So just cross the doubles out. Just cross what, sir? Well, I have on my list for the homework, I have uh, medial and vertebral border, and then lateral or axial border, and then again a vertebral and the, a lateral and the medial border. I'm not sure why I mentioned them twice. You see that? Yeah, on the, on the homework term list. On the upper extremity scapula, I want you to cross out body of scapula, and I'll, I'll show you that, we'll go around. And then we got, we got a couple down, uh, super border, then it says lateral border and medial border again. That term is twice, so just cut them out the second time. Whatever's double. But then we have the spine. You see the spine of the scapula? We'll pick up there. So we have the spine right here. We have the acromion on the end. And then we got these depressions right here and right here, above the spine and below the spine. And the one above the spine, we call that the supraspinous fossa. And the one below, we call that the infraspinous fossa. And these are going to have muscles attached to them. If we turn the scapula around and we look from underneath, we have a subscapular fossa. And sub means below, like a submarine is below the surface of the ocean. Uh, and so that means that fat, that's the fossa underneath. That's the one that goes towards the rib cage. And all those three will have muscles attached to them. There are muscles sitting in here. And the muscles are having this, going to have the same names. Nice. We like that. Is the video on? Yeah. Oops. Then we have an X term, and the term is right in here. That's called the glenoid cavity. Right here, glenoid cavity. And that's the area where the, the arm bone is going to come in. So that's when you have it reeled together, it sits like that. So it, it doesn't, it's a joint that it's made. It's a very interesting shallow sort of joint there. We're going to have a cartilage ring that comes out and really comes around. It's called the labrum. Sometimes, I don't know if you've heard of a labrum tear. Yeah, that sometimes happens. When we get an injury up here, it slams against it and then it breaks. It's like a meniscus kind of structure. Um, that's the glenoid cavity. And then last but not least, we got this weird thing here in the front, like a hook. You can't hardly see, but it comes out. You can see it right here, it comes out, sticks out right there. You feel it? Actually, you can feel it on you. If you go like there, a little medial, it, the bump, it hurts. When you push, it hurts. It's blunt. It's called the coracoid process. What? Coracoid! It's, I always think it's the, it's the raven of the witch sitting there. Coracoid! And so that's how I remember it, like sitting right here. So it's going to be probably, you will remember that, hopefully. Coracoid process right here in the front. So that's pretty much that weird looking bone. Then we got. Uh oh. I'm going to do it over here. We got an arm bone attached to that, uh, that, that scapula right here. Here on the acromion, we can go forward and we have another bone. It's right here, it's the collarbone. And the collarbone is very, very, it's, it's actually flat. It's very breakable. In a cat, it's in the, in the skin. It's called the dermal bone. So it's very fragile. It basically holds the scapula backward. It doesn't really do too much. Well, it has a lot of functions, but it's not like that much of a weight function and a force function. However, the only joint as a bone-to-bone -bone connection that this whole upper extremity has to the trunk is right here. Everything else is muscle. We attach the arm to the shoulder blade, but the shoulder blade itself is, mu is all muscle. And then from here, the acromion, we have this cl a clavicle and that goes to the front and the joint is right here that holds it to the body. So that's kind of interesting. Also, the clavicle is the most broken bone uh, in kids because you just fall down like that, and the force goes in like force goes in like that, and it breaks right here. So be aware of that. 
Um, I only do the bone as a bone. We don't go with what end and all that because it's, it's a small bone. We don't need all that detail. Good. That brings me then right to the humerus. And the humerus is the upper arm bone. Where are we? This is a weird one. We'll just put it back. There's the upper arm bone. Humerus. The brachial area. A whole bunch of muscle attachments. But it's the first really the long bone that we look at. Most of these long bones are all of these long bones are in the extremities. And most significantly, what we have here on top is a round structure. Whenever we have a round structure, it's most likely called a head. So if you're in doubt, call it a head. And then right underneath the head where the round stops is a line kind of that goes around that's called the neck. And then underneath that, there's a couple of bumps that come out. Whenever you have bumps, you think muscle attachments. So these bumps here on the side, they're right here on the outside on us, are actually muscle attachments that then reach into the back, into the front of the shoulder blade, and hold that arm into the shoulder blade. So that's really the attachment of the arm into the body is through these muscles, and they attach to these tubercles. These are called tubercles. We have a lesser tubercle and a greater tubercle. They're right here. Hmm? Okay, the greater face is out. Yeah, the greater, the greater is lateral, the lesser is anterior. The lesser is where the muscle that's going to attach to the front comes from, like there. And the greater is in the back where the muscle goes on the top and then on the bottom. That's a cup on the bottom. Some of my favorite muscles, those are the rotator cuffs. Have you had a rotator cuff problems? Frozen shoulder? You had a frozen shoulder? No? Yeah, I'm too young. It's usually up here is a problem. It's a muscle, frozen shoulders really like when there's a, a rotator cuff. Or these muscles are called rotator cuffs. We'll talk about that when we get to the muscles. Very interesting. In between the two bumps, we have a little groove, a little line, a little valley that goes down in between. We're actually going to have a, a tendon going through here, the biceps tendon. That's the biceps, where the tendon goes through there. So it's important that that stays in that groove and doesn't jump out. So that could be a problem, potentially. That's known as the intertubercular groove. Inter means in between. Inter in between. Between the tubercles. When I came to America, I started massage first. That's how I learned English. That's why some of these terms, I'm like, is that a colloquial term or an anatomy? I don't know, right? Uh, and they said, oh, here it says sulcus, but the other term is groove. We only learned it as groove when I first learned it. And I would stick up my hand and go like, in front of 30 people, like, groove? Isn't that when we do music? That's a nice groove. It's like the, so that's how I learned English. You know? So I understand when you go to school and you learn English, it's like, damn. But it's kind of fun. So right there we had that head, right? And then we had these tubercles. And in between the tubercle and the head, we have that line, and that's a, that's a neck. But that's, we are called, that's called the anatomical neck. Then we have a second neck. Oops, where's the second neck? Right here. We have that anatomical neck, and then we have a surgical neck. And the reason why we have two here, because when we look, this piece is really nice and wide, then it gets nice and skinny down. So this is sort of the neck proper, because we can't have a head and then a tubercle and then a neck. That's kind of weird. So we have to have an anatomical neck, but then down here is the neck that breaks. So I, that's where you do surgery. So if, if it breaks, it breaks down here. So it causes a surgical neck. And then from there, we got to go down the shaft. That's the shaft. But what I want is on the side of the shaft, there's a roughage somewhere midline here on the outside, right here. It's known as the deltoid tuberosity. You got a rough jump bone, you gotta have muscles attached into it. That's how they anchor into the bone. They actually have the muscles actually have these anchors. They're like these hooks. They hook in and they can't let go. They're sharpies fibers, they're called. They're really strong. It's very interesting. So deltoid, the deltoid is this muscle. On the outside, the outside pocket muscle. So we'll get to that on next week, I think. And then all we need on that thing is. 
as we go further down, we got these bumps on the outside, on the inside, on the outside, right there. That bump and that bump. They are known as epicondyle. So you got a, a medial epicondyle and a lateral epicondyle. The medial epicondyle, you can feel the medial, you probably hit that before, it hurts, that right here, the bone. That's the medial epicondyle. That's a muscle attachment for all the muscles in the forearm. They come all from, well not all of them, but generally speaking. They come from here and they go forward like that. That's a medial epicondyle. On the outside is the lateral epicondyle. We have the muscles, generally speaking, that go on the top attached into there. So we'll talk about that when we get to them. A condyle, condyle means joint. This actually means, I think it means knuckle. So like the, the knee, we're gonna, look, we're gonna start looking at the knee. These bumps here, these big things, these are called condyles. In the, in the arm, we got them too. They're similar, they're looking like here. They are also condyles, but they changed the damn name because they have to have variety. So they're not called condyles here anymore, but they're called, one is called a trochlea, right here. That's the trochlea on the medial side. Looks like a pulley to some people. And then the other one on the outside is known as the capitulum. That one's a little more to understand because it looks a little bit like a head, like round. The capit is the head. Sometimes the capit is caput. Oh no, that's German. Never mind. That's nice. A little goofy here. So the trochlea and the capitulum, I want you to study, but I do not have them on the test list. Okay? Epicondyle, absolutely. I need you to know that word condyle because it comes all over the place. And you associate that with joint. But specifically the medial and the lateral condyle? Yes, on the, on the epicondyles, I'm, I'm, I'm picky about it, yeah. Uh, and then when we turn it around, we turn that bottom part around here, we got one more term that I'm interested in, and that's a, a fossa in the back. It's known as the olecranon fossa. And olecranon is actually the elbow proper. So when you put your elbow down, you, you're putting it down right here, and that is actually a forearm muscle, bone. It's going to be the forearm bone. So the elbow proper is made by the forearm bone. Actually, it's one of those that, let's see if I have a single one here. A little bit. If you look at it from the side, it, has, it looks like a wrench. You could put something in it, close it down, like, you know, if it has a different shape. But that piece, that's the elbow proper. So it sits in like, like that. You know, like, like that, right there. So that piece here, as we now go to the forearm, bone, bones. See right here, that's the elbow proper. I put this in here, where is it? Dude, look at that, that's, a, that's a, a replacement, a prosthesis. I don't know if you want to have that elbow, that's pretty tough. Although if you break it, you have to do it. So here, that's the ulna. Right here, ulna. So when you see that arm that has a wrench, the, the bone that has a wrench, that's the ulna. Ah, I don't have that. Do I have that? Oh yeah, here. And you see that word here? It's the electron arm. That's the wrenchy part. The electron arm is the wrenchy part. Uh, it also means, they also call it olecranon process. And the olecranon process will fit into the olecranon fossa of the humerus. I know, words out. So the humerus has that, that fossa, the depression, and then the ulna has the process that fits into it. Olecranon means elbow, I think.
I'll go through this list. Some things are a little off here. Head of the old now, cross that out. We're not worried about it. Please. But what I'd like to point out is the, the bottom part here gets the bone. The ulna is kind of fat, on, big on the bottom, on top, and then as it goes to the bottom, it gets nice and skinny. And it's got this little thing here on the side. You see that little thing sticking out? That's known as the styloid process. Remember we have one in the head. Little pen, pen thing. Styloid is a pen, like a stylus. So that's down here. All more styloid process. And then the other bone we have in the forearm is the radius. And the radius is sort of skinny on top and thicker on the bottom. On the bottom, we also have that little thing sticking out. It's called styloid also. Radial styloid, or styloid of the radius. As we get back to the top, we got a round thing here. It goes around. It's called a head. Ha! Round head. There's actually a, and then, and then it goes, so you have the round head, and then it bends in a little bit, and then it has another bump. The bending in is known as the neck, logically. So around the neck, there is this round ligament that holds that thing in. And when we do this motion, that turns around up here. And so that's the reason why the anatomical position is this way, because the radius and the ulna are, are, are parallel. If we go palm down, they cross over. If we palm down, is pronate. Palm up is supinate. Whoa. Palm down is pronate. Oh, yeah, I have to get that one. Oh, we got it. Uh, what else do I need to say about Oh, yeah. The, the, the ligament around here can be pulled over the head if you like. You take a kid and you say, come on, let's go. And you yank the head, the arm. Not the head, the, the arm, the head. And so they call an injury that that thing falls out, and you sort of have to guide it back in and push it in. It's not that hard, but it hurts like crazy. I don't know. They call that injury a nursemaid's elbow which is not really that fair, but. Uh -oh. I know some of these models are getting a little old, huh? Abused, too much abuse. <clears throat> so, there we, so we have now the neck, the head, the neck, and then the bump is the tubercle of the radius, or radial. They shouldn't call that tuberosity. Tuberosity is usually big, and tubercle is usually small. So they interchange that. So I think on the list they probably put tubercle on there, right? No, I said tuberosity, okay. Either or. On the test you have the list, then you don't worry about it. You just write what's on the list. And you have a cheat sheet, right? Remember that? On the test, for the test list, you can write on the test list to make your notes. I know, it's nice. The only class you can use your cheat sheet. You know why I do that? Because when you want to study for a test real well, one of the best ways is you make a cheat sheet. But you can never bring it to school. So this one time you can bring it. And then you know how valuable it is. So we can have this and a cheat sheet? No, you're going to have to term list and no, you can draw on it. Let me show it. Let me just do that now. <laughs> you can have that thing now. So see, the test list is only one page. So you can use that page and all that page to take notes. And I should bring on it, I should bring an example in. I savored some examples from like, wow, you did that? You don't have to do it that way, it's all. So you can have this, I, I made copies for you guys. So you can start studying for the test. So once you finish the homework, this is the homework list, except I made a lot of mistakes, but I'll correct those. But on the homework list, I wanted to label the homework terms. After that, you go straight to the test list, and you, cr you don't worry about all the extra terms. You just worry about those. That way, you maximize your study efforts. All right, what else we got? I think that's it. Head, neck, radial tuberosity or tubercle, and styloid process of the radius. And then from there, we get into the carpals. Whoa, look at all that. Yeah, question? No? Oh, you're 
Look at all the corpus. Hame, Pisiform, Triquetrum, Lune, Trapezium, Trapezoid, Scat. You want to learn all those? Next time, not now. What's important on this is the fact that we have, we have a proximal row and we have a distal row. So we have the radius and the ulna that come here. They make a little, little hollow groove and then this is actually the carpal tunnel area. And then we, we have this wrist that is made by small little bones in one row here and then in the distal row and from there we're going to go into the web of the hand. And the web of the hand are these called metacarpals. So I want to make sure it doesn't fall apart. So carpals, metacarpals. And then the top here, those are the fingers. Those are called the phalanges. We do not have different names for every metacarpal. And every phalange. Thank God. It's enough with these. But yes? For what? Digital? No. Um, the digits are the fingers all together. The phalanges are the bones. So we have, so we have, we count them. We count them from the thumb or the pollux, as in one, to the pinky, as in five. So we just list them as numbers. And then when you get to the phalanges, what's interesting is we have three phalanges for all the fingers. That's why you can do that. But the thumb, you can't do that. You only have two phalanges for the thumb. So you've got a proximal, middle, and distal. But then in the thumb, you only have a proximal and a distal. No middle. Good. That's not too bad, I think. Here's a picture of the carpal tunnel. So when you actually, you can, you can take your, your wrist this way, right here, and, and, and there is a little groove that gets created by these bones that come in, and on top of these bones you have a ligament, and underneath there, see, that's a tunnel right there. So they go, a lot of tendons go through here. As a matter of fact, all the tendons from the forearm muscles, forearm muscles, finger muscles, movements, the muscles here, the tendons go through here, and then, you know, down underneath, through the tunnel, and then what we also have going through here is a nerve. It's known as the median nerve. And when muscle move, uses a lot, it gets warm and hot, it expands. The nerve is kind of a, you know, not as strong. It's like gentle and sensitive. And so it gets squeezed, and then you feel tingling. And that's the carpal tunnel syndrome. Have you had that before? I know. A lot of typing. And then the problem with that nerve is actually, if you go further, the nerve also goes to a muscle here that missed the muscle that pulls the palm down. So guess how you are when you type? So you contract this muscle going down and then you type a lot and I guess that's not going to be happy in the nerve. And then the next place is <coughs> up here where the nerve comes out of the neck. And it goes through a muscle. We're going to talk about that muscle Wednesday. It's called the scalenes right in here. And the, the nerve goes straight to these muscles and the scalenes are attached to the ribs. And so you hold up your hand because you have to type and your shoulders go up. The boss is all mad at you because you're not fast enough. And you type really fast and you're all tense. And then this is tense here, this is tense here, this is tense here. Everything fires up. So you get squeezed everywhere. So that's when in medicine then they do a nerve conduction velocity test. So they prickle you and they see how fast does the nerve travel? Where, how, where is it impeded? And if it's impeded down in here, really down in here, Guess what they do? Surgery. They do, they cut this up. That way you make room. But you have to be careful. You really want this to be the problem before you cut your fingers off, or your hand, your wrist. Because if not, you have a cut here and you still have the problem. And so that can be a challenge. But if need be, we need to do it. But if you have a doc, if, if, you, if you want to do it, and I think now they do it all the time anyway, the nerve conduction velocity study, do not. But if they don't, do not get caught before you have the test. Or call me and we'll talk about 
because um, surgery is great, but only if it's really necessary. We first we do stuff on the outside that is not really that drastic. Then we take some pills, see how that goes, chemical stuff, and then we do surgery. We have to, but that's sort of my philosophy. Less, least drastic to most drastic, not just jumping right at it. Where it gets me if it's back surgery and it's like that's really tough. But anyway, I need to move on to the lower extremities. Hello, the pelvis. Hmm. So. The pelvis, and we have these models that are from here to here, and I'll bring them in on Wednesday, I'll find them. Um, here's the proper pelvis. We talked about the sacrum already, and now we're going to talk about what's also known as the uh, coxal bone or the os coxa. If you see the term os, os, it's on the list. Os, and then coxa. If you see the word os, you know it's a bone. Os means bone. Osseous, they call it. Osteopath, it's a bone joint up. So the, I mentioned that before that oscox, so we have two of them actually, one on each side. They're made up of three bones: the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. The, the top part, the front part, and the butt part. Here they're color coded: the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. They meet up in this, well, this is much, if you think of the upper extremities, you got this glenoid cavity and it's really shallow. Down here, that's a sturdy, this is a sturdy ball and socket. This is a socket and a ball that's pretty big. Um, it also has a labrum around it still, so you can also have a labrum tear down there. That hurts. Actually, I never had it, so I don't know, but it, it, they tell me it hurts. And so that socket here is known as the acetabulum. Acetabular, nice word, I think. Well, let's go to the ilium first. The top here, the biggest part of that, is known as the iliac crest. That's where the baby sits. It's an easy ridge, perfect. Um, then we go back and we, we reach back on that crest till we get to a blunt spot. And you can actually feel it right here in the back, that blunt spot. That's known as the posterior superior iliac spine. Oh, P-S-I-S. P-S-I-S, posterior superior iliac spine. I can actually then go a little bit down, I get a little divot and another bump. That would be the posterior inferior iliac spine. Whew. I don't think, is that on the list? Oh yeah, it's not on the test list. But you need to label it once so we know you've seen it. Then below that, we have this. You can really stick your thumb into it. So that's the PSIS, the PIIS, and then here where you can <coughs> stick your finger in, it's known as the greater sciatic notch. Greater sciatic notch. Then we go all the way back up to the crest, we go to the front, and we got a little more edgy bump in the front here, um, right there. It's still bump because if you fall on it and it's too edgy, it's gonna hurt really bad. Um, and that's known as the anterior superior iliac spine, or AS, or as is from Ikea. You always, if you go to Ikea, you go to the as is section first, you know that, right? Get good deals there. Got some great furniture there. Nothing really wrong with it. Anyway, uh, uh, then it has a little divot and a second little bump, not really a big bump, but that's technically the anterior inferior iliac spine. Superior, above, inferior, below. And then we have the iliac fossa, and that's this in here. The stuff in here, iliac fossa. That's a muscle, the iliacus. Oh, iliac, iliacus, great name for a muscle right there. 
There's a muscle in here that's attaching it. That actually attaches in here and goes all the way to this small bump and it raises up your leg. So muscle here and then one that's attaching to the, to the spine. You might as well just do it real quick. So it attaches in here and in here and together it goes to this bump and that raises the spine, raises the fire. And so that is often a problem because we're sitting all day. So it's always short, that muscle's always short. When it's short, it glues together, it gets stiffy. When you stand up, it's like, oh, you gotta spin and bend out. Do you have that after a long car ride? You have to stretch out, that's partly because they get stiff. We'll talk about those muscles when we go on Wednesday. Some of my favorites. And then the last term on the ilium is um, right here we, where the sacrum comes together with the ilium, that's known as the auricular foss, auricular surface it is, I think. Auricular surface, yeah. And it's not labeled. It's, it's the part of the ilium that makes the sacroiliac joint. But look at these names. Sacro is sacrum, iliac is ilium. When you have a joint, you always mention the bones that make the joint, that make the connection. That tells you what's it, what it is. So the auricular surface on your model is this piece here. That makes the joint. And it looks a little bit, if you're really squinting really bad, it looks like a little bit of it, like an ear. Oracle is like an ear, like a little bit like that. You just gotta believe it. These the, 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 the real bone models show those, the, those things a little bit better than the plastics. Okay, that then brings me to the ischium, and the ischium is the sit bone. Oh, actually, the bone where the sit bone is at, and the sit bone itself is known as the ischial tuberosity. Now, that's a big tuberosity. That's a big honking bone. We're gonna have all muscles, not all of them, but lots of muscles for the inside thigh, and pretty much all of them for the hammies, the hamstrings in the back are attached to that ischial tuberosity. The inside thigh muscles are cool because they have to bring the, the, the leg inward. And so they are attached in the front and in the back. So they are like coming this way. So they have a lot of variability in angling. So next time you watch a football game and they go back and forth or so, so soccer, so you see that's all these muscles working. It's crazy how versatile they are. Ischial tuberosity, what else do we have on the ischium? We have an ischial spine. We have an ischial ramus, and we have an obturator for ramen. Oh, holy moly. Um, the ischial spine is that little bump there. That's the ischial spine, right there. The ischial ramus is the bar-like structure that comes forward from the ischial tuberosity and then feeds into the front where the pubis bone is. The front is where the pubic is. Now it's all twisted, there we go. The front here is where the pubic is. You see it right here. So on the, on the connect, on the model that's together, you have the ischial tuberosity in the back, the butt, and then the ramus comes to the front, and then we have the pubic bone. So the ramus for the issue is really only till about halfway, and from there then, we have the pubic bone, and guess what? On the pubic bone, we also have a ramus. We actually have a ramus here, it's the inferior ramus, we got one here, it's a superior ramus. Oh, detail. Homework detail, not all of it is test detail. So again, from the sit bone, we go forward towards the pubis, we have the ischial ramus, and then as we get to the forward part, we get to the pubis, so we call that the inferior pubic ramus. And then we got the pubic symphysis, that's the joint in the front. And from there going backwards is the superior pubic ramus. And then at some point we start, we go into the acetabulum and from there we become the ileum again. And I think that's all these terms right there. Whew, that was a lot. It better be a lot, it's a big pelvis. Oh, and the pelvis, and that's one place where the guys and the ladies are different. A, 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 a woman's pelvis has to give birth, and so it has to have, it has to be wider. 
you can't, this is, look at, look at this, look at narrow, how narrow this is compared to how wide this is. The baby can't get through you. Not even if it's Arnold Schwarzenegger in that movie. The baby can go through here, that's fine. Well, not always, but most of the time. Um, and so you can differentiate between a male and a female pelvis by the width on top in terms of what's the, uh, the false pelvis, how wide the false pelvis is. That's the beginning part. It's not the, the false pelvis is where the baby sits, and then the true pelvis is where it's got to get through. Well, that's for another day. So the, the female is much wider up here. And then the other thing we can do is we can, we can take the angle down here, and we see that angle in a female pelvis is much wider than the one in a male pelvis. It's called the pubic angle, pubic arch. It's less than 90, even more than 90 or 100. Uh, in, and that in, 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 in radiology, x-ray taking people, they're really funny. They consider that an upside down martini glass, no, champagne glass. Yeah, champagne glass, because it's narrow, and then that's a martini glass. I guess they all go drinking after work or something. Yeah. But it's very funny, when you, when you do some radiology, we had to learn some reading of x-rays. When I went to school, and the turn statements are just very funny. Like, what is the Scotty dog fracture and stuff like that? Like, really weird terms. I think they're also bored otherwise. Okay, that brings us to the thigh bone. In, the, in anatomy, this is the thigh, this is the leg. Thigh, leg. Here, this is the arm, this is the forearm. So it's a little different. But so the thigh is the femur. Femur, big round thing, big bump, what's it called? What do you think? A head. Below that is a neck. Femoral head, femoral neck. And then we got a big bump on the outside. You know that's what, the one you hit on the outside. That's known as the, oh wait, I'm not here yet. The greater trochanter. Trochanter, big bump. A lot of muscle attachments. Actually, all the muscles, pretty much, well, not all of them, but most of them, they come from the rim here, and then the sacrum, they anchor it here, like, they're like a wheel. So they do all the type of work. They hold, you know, standing so the pelvis doesn't fall down, and that kind of stuff. Um, we'll talk about that when we get to it. So that's the greater trochanter. Then on the other side, on the inside, right in here medially, we have a lesser trochanter. That's where that muscle mass is attached that I talked to you about from coming from here and bringing the thigh up. That's where, that's where that attaches, in the lesser trochanter. And then I got that term there, fofea capitis. And capit means head. Fofea is a little depression. That's in the middle of the head. That's actually there. And you have a ligament that goes from there into the acetabulum and holds the femur in there more, so it doesn't fall out. That helps. That's the fovea capitis. Then we got the linea aspera. So when you then turn the femur around, the shaft of the femur in the back has a line, a ridgy line, and that is a lot of muscle attachments. Actually, your quads, lots of your quads, they come from the back and they go to the front. That that they're that big. They reach around. You also have a lot of the adductors, the medial muscles that bring the leg inward, they're also attached in there. Lots of stuff. That's the linea aspera. Where is it? Oh, here. Linea aspera. Nice term. It's a little not as easy, well, it's easy to see, but it's much sharper on a real bone, not on a plastic bone. And then if you go downward, we got these two big bumps. They're known as the condyle. We have a medial condyle and a lateral condyle. Condyles make joints. This is interesting. This knee joint is interesting because we think it's just like, like this one. It closes and opens. Like it, it bends, like it's a door closed and a hinge thing. It's not really. It's more like these, 
it's kind of biomechanically not really properly made that way in a model because these knuckles, these condyles or knuckles, they roll on the tibia on the lower leg bone. That's why when we get to that next bone, the big, big shin bone, that's the tibia. Tibia. And the top pieces of the tibia are also known as condyle. Now we have femoral condyles, now we also have tibial condyles. Medial and lateral. Whew. Four terms, one name. Isn't that cool? There you go. Check it out, check it out, check it out. Ha. In between those condyles, we've got a little raised structure here. It's known as the interconjular eminence. Yes, Your Highness. So the king's sitting in here. This is actually made of ligament attachments. So in the knee, look at the knee here. In the knee, we got, oh yeah, I can actually do this hole here. So we got the condyles here on the femur, the other side they can see, then the tibia, we have the condyle here and here, and in between is that eminence, and inside there you've got ligaments. You've got one here, and you've got one here. And they're actually crossing over a little bit. So they're known as the cruciate ligaments. ACL, have you ever heard of an ACL tear? We're on the the front one. Yeah, you know, you go down and it keeps going on top and the thing sticks backwards, that's the ACL tear. So that's why when you are in working out, you work out? That's <laughs> right. I know, right? Oh yeah, well, we're working on that. <laughs> um, they tell you, don't put your knee in front of your foot when you go down. That's why. We don't want to stress the ACL. It's too much, too quick. And so the other thing you have in this knee, you got these ridges, you see these ridge cartilage ridges, they're wide on top, on the outside, they go in like that. They're sort of, and, and, and then what they do, so they're sitting like on top of this flatness, and they glide, they guide the, 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 the condyles, the femoral condyles, when we bend the knee, so it, they roll like that. The condyles roll sort of on the tibial condyle, the femoral condyles. But they're guided, the motion is guided by the menisci or meniscus, we have one on the outside, one on the inside, meniscus. And you know, it's fibro cartilage, that's like Tupperware structure. Very, very sturdy. But it also is a lick, can be a little bit brittle and it can chop off, and then you have a meniscus tail. And then often as you move your joint, and all of a sudden it hurts like hell, because some piece is lodged in here, and it stretches these ligaments and that hurts. I had it happen once, I was like 20, I was like, God, what's wrong with me? I can't even walk no more. Yeah. And my first wife was like, I don't know about your marriage, he's hard. Mm -hmm. Never mind, that was funny. This is an artificial knee. I, I just had one, one of my newer patients, I think. Oh, no, 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 my ex-mother-in-law. She has a knee replacement, and now they took an extra of her knee, and they they, they printed one, according to her. So we're there now. So that's great, because then the rehab is way better than doing metal. They have some good hard plastic. So that's cool. The other thing um, here that I mess mentioning so far on the femur, back to the femur, is we have this patellar surface behind the kneecap. And the kneecap is known as the patella. And the patella is really cool. I mean, if you think about it, you have all these thigh muscles here, and they come down, like from here straight down, and then they attach right in here. Oh, this, by the way, is known as the tibial tuberosity. The bump in the front of the knee, tibial tuberosity. That's where all the quad muscles anchor in. That's your biggest muscle mass you got. They anchor all in here. That's a lot of point. So a lot of times when we're teenagers, especially boys, we're very active, the bone doesn't respond as fast to the muscle growth, and the muscle pulls on it and yanks on it, and this gets inflamed. Tibial tendonitis. Tibial tendonitis. Or osteochlotter, if it's real bad. The typical treatment, they say, takes about two years. Two years? It's a teenage boy. What are you going to do with that kid? So I researched, because the guy who makes my sandwiches, Sometimes 
he has a kidney, he had it. I was like, no, 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 let me think about that. Let me, and I found a physical therapist in Australia who is Olympic level, and she had a technique that fixed it in three weeks, apparently. And the technique was you do like, you go like that with some olive oil twice a day for a few minutes. And you strength, you lengthen all the quad muscles, so to speak, which takes the pressure off the tibial tuberosity because it's not yanking so much. How simple is that? It's cool. I want to, you know, it was like, wow, why didn't anybody else think of that first, you know? And so that's why I want to bring that thinking in because it's like, it's not that complicated. The more we understand the anatomy and how it sort of functions, the easier we can, you know, get a handle of these kind of things. And so I tell everybody, because that's one of like, the kids need to know that. Or you can have a roll or you just roll down. It's like it's, it's anyway, food for thought. And so the kneecap is the patella. So, oh yeah, back to why we have a patella. So if you think of all the quads coming from behind here, coming from here, going down and anchoring into this. Without a patella, we have a, a steep cutoff. Like we go from here and then it goes straight down, a 90 degree angle. If I want to contract this muscle and have a movement that's guided and it's a 90 degree angle, I need a lot of force generated here until this initial pull is overcome. And, and once that's overcome, it yanks it up like so fast because then it's way too much force. So with the patella, I can round the muscle going down and I can adjust the force I have to apply so I have smooth motion. So that's a, the biggest sesamoid bone we have. And the sesamoid bone is a bone that's not really a bone bone type, it's a, it's a calcification type bone inside a tendon. We have it here, we have it here, we have it here, many places. But if this is the easy one to understand biomechanically why we have that. So it favors the motion pattern. It helps us smooth out the motion. So that's really cool. So that's the patella. And then we go back to the tip. So we'll do tibia real quick here. With tibial tuberosity in the front, we got the lateral condyle, medial condyle, intercondylar eminence, real highness. And then we got the tibia itself. And then on the bottom, we got the ankles. And we got the inside ankle, and we got an outside ankle bump. Yeah, this was rubbing on my ski boot. It hurt. Uh, uh, so that often, or when you bicycle. Have you ever hit that when you bicycle? Oof. It hurts. It's like the bump. Yeah, what? yeah, right. <laughs> sure, Carl. <Kyle. laughs> With all your sports. So that hurts. That's known as the medial malleolus. Oh, nice word. Medial malleolus. That's the inside. That's on the tibia. So the medial malleolus is on the tibia, and then when we go to the outside one, it's actually on the other bone. It's on the fibula. And the fibula is the skinny bone on the outside there. And so that thing down here is the fibula, no, the lateral malleolus, and then we just go all the way to the top, and on top we call that the head, head of the fibula. That's all we worry about here. And I only show these in the skeleton that's articulated. I'm not going to put a bone up and say, what's the head? What's the, you, know, you wouldn't know which one. It looks so similar. So that's that. And then we get to, from there, we have only a little bit left. <clears throat> and that's the ankle and the foot. So in the hand, we have the carpals. In the foot, we have the tarsals. Carpals, tarsals. I'm only going to point out a few here. The heel bone is known as the calcaneus. Calcaneus is the heel bone. And then the other bone that I want you to know is this cube shaped bone that's right here where the tibia comes down and pushes right onto it. It's known as the talus. It's known as the talus. And from there, then. The force, you know, it's force coming down, a lot of force, you know, when you're on one foot and you jump, that's a lot of force. And so from there, the force gets distributed to the front and to the back, and underneath here in the foot, we have this arch. We have this, where is it? I guess it's not there. There it is. We have this longitudinal arch. If we don't have an arch, it's flat feet. When I did the seminar for my that great muscle technique that I learned 
the doctor took me and said, yeah, stand on this table there and every, take your shoes off. Everybody go look, 20 doctors look at my feet. He has flat feet. I guess I have flat feet. <laughs> Many people have flat feet. Um, that's one reason why, this is one place where inserts are fine. I don't like you know, bracing too much and supporting the body unless it's necessary, but not all the time. But in the feet, there's some, there's some stuff we can do, but it's really hard to activate these muscles inside enough that they're gonna give you an arch back. So there's some support that puts the arch up, that's, that's good. Super feet. We also have an arch this way, in the front. So that's nice, it bounces this way a little bit, that's cool. But if it doesn't, if it goes down, it hurts and it feels like we're walking on marbles. And that's known as plantar fasciitis. So, down here we have a thick um, band that spans, it's the sole of the foot basically, and that's known as the plantar fascia. Fascia is a thick, uh, um, it's a soft tissue, it's like a big thick ligament, the fascia, flat, a flat ligament. And it goes across and if it gets inflamed we call it itis, fasciitis, so it would be plantar fasciitis. And that's often when that arch is sort of a little bit collapsed. So if you have that problem, we'll, we'll talk about what to do about it and call me. Um, and then on this one I wanted to also mention is when we twist our ankle. We break these ligaments or we overstretch these ligaments on the outside and then we don't have the stability here so much anymore. So then the calf muscles that go around here, that anchor actually all the way over here, we'll talk about those, they have to do all that work to hold the ankle from a straight position and they get really, really tight. So if you have tight musculature here, because you have loosey ankles and you twist them all the time, it's something you can massage or so, but just, it goes together with it. Okay, so what else we got there? We got the phalanges, and the phalanges are like the ones in the hand. We got the tarsals here, I don't, they're not as complicated. This is navicular, these are the cuneiforms, and this is the cuboid, so there's not as many names. You'll learn that next time. But these are then the metatarsals, and again, one through five. Big toe, which is hulks, to the little toe, the pinky toe. Uh, metatarsals, and then at the end, we got the phalanges again, and the phalanges are the same. Even the little pinky toe has three phalanges, and the big honking big toe has only two. So the size of the bones don't matter. This is actually considered a long bone, even though it's tiny, but it's longer than wide. Still considered a long bone. All right, good. Any questions? All right, let's get to work. There's a lot of terms.